What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. What I want you guys to do before we get started in this video, I want you guys to take a second, go down the description box below. We got links to our website where there'll be a lot of awesome notes and illustrations that I think will be super critical for you guys to follow along with me during this lecture. Also, if you guys benefit from this lecture, please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, let's start talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease. So GERD is this basic concept. It's super, super basic in which things like nasty stuff like hydrochloric acid contents from the stomach, unfortunately, will just decide to move its way upwards into the esophagus. Now, when that happens, what's the downside of that? What's the actual problematic issue with this actual hydrochloric acid getting into the esophagus? Well, if we zoom in here, what you'll notice is that this acid substance within the actual esophagus can cause a lot of problems. One of these things is it can lead to just common sensations such as heartburn. And this may manifest, if you will, with this burning retrosternal chest pain that usually occurs after meals and it's really bad when you lay supine. Sometimes, because the esophagus is not just here within the chest, but it can actually come down here just to the epigastric level, you may even have epigastric pain. We call this dyspepsia. It's that burning pain that you may have right here in the epigastrium. So two very common manifestations is going to be heartburn and dyspepsia. This is super critical, and the reason why is because this hydrochloric acid is gonna be coming up into the esophagus, causing a lot of burning and inflammation. Now the question I have for you guys is, what are some of the complications that are associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease? So the basic concept is hydrochloric acid is coming up into the esophagus, it's ripping it up, causing heartburn, dyspepsia, but it can also do a lot of other things, like what? It can really inflame the esophagus and start ulcerating it, and this can lead to esophagitis. Additionally, with the esophagitis, sometimes patients can come in presenting with like things like odynophagia, like a lot of pain with swallowing, that's one common thing. The other problem here is that as you kind of cause this constant inflammation over time, if this esophagus is being inflamed and inflamed and inflamed, it'll then undergo a fibrotic reaction to heal, but it'll narrow the actual lumen of the esophagus, and this can lead to stricture formation. Another potential complication associated with this gastroesophageal reflux disease is that sometimes, this is very, very interesting, with this hydrochloric acid, not only can it inflame the esophagus lead to strictures, but sometimes the actual contents can move its way into the airway. And this could lead to features of a lot of what's called kind of a reflux or an aspiration type of event. So you wanna watch out for aspiration. Now, the problems with this, very quickly, is if you aspirate some of this hydrochloric contents into the larynx, it can cause laryngitis. What's a common manifestation of that? Voice changes. If it goes into the bronchioles, it can inflame the bronchioles and lead to inflammation of the bronchioles. What could that worsen? Asthma. So the other ways that I want you to think about GERD presenting is not just with esophagitis or strictures, but aspiration that can lead to hoarseness, larynx, and worsening asthma, bronchial inflammation. Boom, roasted. What's another potential complication? You know, if you erode and ulcerate the esophagus, there's blood vessels that are lining that. You can erode into the actual blood vessel and lead to bleeding. So you wanna watch out for GI bleeding. Ways that GI bleeds can present is this can have a patient who presents with like a lot of maybe anemia, right? So maybe it's an actual uh, a lab finding or they can present with a lot of fatigue. That's another particular thing. The last and scariest complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease over chronic and chronic and chronic inflammation is you increase the risk of what's called esophageal cancer. With that being said, one of the very interesting concepts here that we have to dig into just quickly for the pathophysiology is whenever you look at normal cells of the esophagus, it's actually stratified squamous. So it's stratified squamous. So here we'll actually write on the side here, this should be squamous cells. But whenever you expose the actual squamous cells over a long period of time to a lot of hydrochloric acid, this will cause the cells to have to adapt. When the cells have to adapt, they undergo something called metaplasia. So whenever they adapt, they change into a different type of cell. And this is gonna be called columnar cells. This process where they go from squamous to columnar, you know what that's called? 
This is called metaplasia. Let's actually write that here. This process here is called metaplasia. All right, beautiful. So going from the squamous cells to the columnar cells is called metaplasia. But then if you continue and continue to cause more erosive damage, more inflammation, you can turn these columnar cells into neoplastic cells. So you can turn these into neoplastic cells. Let's stick with our color here, which we did was blue. So again, this is our neoplastic cells. So this here, going from columnar cells to neoplastic cells, is called dysplasia. So one of the biggest things to understand here is with this metaplasia aspect, that's really a very specific type of intermediate. So I want you guys to understand kind of the progression here, is that the progression of this disease is you have something called Barrett's, and then over time, this Barrett's will then progress to what's called adenocarcinoma. So this is the metaplasia, this is the dysplasia. So this is the concept that I want you guys to understand. Okay, now let's go and let's talk about the different causes of GERD. All right, my friends, so gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, dyspepsia from the reflux of the hydrochloric acid. We know the complications associated with it. Esophagitis, strictures, aspiration. We also know that you can have GI bleeds and we know that you can have esophageal cancer. The question that you have to ask yourself is why is the hydrochloric acid going up into the esophagus as much as it is, as it is causing these complications? There's four particular reasons. One of the reasons is that this part here, this is a problematic area for us. This area here is called the lower esophageal sphincter. It's supposed to be nice and tight and prevent things like hydrochloric acid from going up into the esophagus. But what if the tone is really low? That's one particular mechanism. So a low, lower esophageal sphincter tone. Another particular mechanism that can cause this is that there is a defect somewhere here. So you know the esophagus is supposed to go up through this little area here called the esophageal hiatus. But in certain patients, they have a defect within that junction and it slides upwards. And if it slides upwards above the actual esophageal hiatus, this is a very significant problem for GERD. You know what that's called? Where parts of the esophagus slides up above the esophageal hiatus? This is called a hiatal hernia. Remember that, hiatal hernia. Okay, the third particular problem here is that the hydrochloric acid that you're producing by the stomach is much more. So if you have hydrochloric acid going up into the esophagus, it's gonna burn it. But what if you had a lot more hydrochloric acid? You're likely gonna cause more symptoms. The more hydrochloric acid, the more severe the actual GERD can be. So another particular problem here is that we have cells of the stomach that is just banging out hydrochloric acid. So that's another particular mechanism, is increased hydrochloric acid production. All right, let me take you through a quick mechanism here of why this is a problem and how we can actually treat this. So here we have a couple parietal cells. You know parietal cells are cells that make hydrochloric acid? There's a couple ways that they do this. One way that they do this is they use these kind of like proton potassium ATPases to push out things like potassium and pro, I'm sorry, push out things like protons. And these protons are what make the hydrochloric acid content super, super acidic. So there's one thing, that's the proton pumps, but you also have little receptors here on these cells that tell them to actually stimulate and increase the production of hydrochloric acid. You know what these are? These are histamine II receptors. So what are these particular receptors here? These guys here are called histamine II receptors. When these receptors are stimulated, they increase, they increase the hydrochloric acid production. And this is super important because you know when we talk about pharmacology, if we give drugs that block this proton pump, like proton pump inhibitors, you would decrease the hydrochloric acid production. If we give drugs that block the histamine from binding to the H2 receptors, you would block hydrochloric acid production. That'll come into play when we talk about the actual pharmacology. Okay, the last particular mechanism here is that you have a very high intragastric pressure. Imagine the pressure in your stomach is higher than the pressure within your esophagus. Where are things gonna to wanna to go? From high pressure to low pressure. Things will decompress into the esophagus. So that's the last particular problem here is you're gonna have a patient who has very high intragastric pressure. All right, so out of all of this, these are the four reasons why the patient would develop a very nasty gastroesophageal reflux disease. What I wanna do is I wanna quickly talk about
What are the things that decrease the lower esophageal sphincter tone? What are the actual basic type of hiatal hernia that is really, really highly associated with GERD? What increases hydrochloric acid production? And what increases intragastric pressure? So let's come down here and let's go through these and let's write them all down because again, I think this will help you with the repetition. First one, decrease the lower esophageal sphincter tone. Next one is you have a hiatal hernia. Third one is you have high intragastric pressure. And the fourth mechanism is you have increased hydrochloric acid production. Okay, we have to now say what is the reasons why you have a low esophageal sphincter tone. One of these is because the patient is smoking, drinking alcohol, or they're just consuming tons and tons of caffeine. These are very, very common triggers. So I want you to remember these particular causes. All right, so again, smoking, alcohol, caffeine are triggers that lower the esophageal sphincter tone. All right, <clears throat> hiatal hernias, what is the most common type associated with GERD? I want you to remember sliding hernias, sliding hernias. The next thing I want you to remember is what are the things that can increase the intragastric pressure causing it to decompress the contents into the esophagus? Pregnancy, obesity, as well as very large meals and one other disease called gastroparesis. So again, pregnancy, obesity, very large meals, gastroparesis, which is a disease associated with diabetes. It's where the nerves of the actual stomach aren't actually working properly, so the stomach can't contract. If you can't contract, can you empty things into the actual duodenum? No. So all the stomach does is distend, 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 pressure rises, can decompress into the actual esophagus. The last one here is you increase hydrochloric acid production. The big things are things like NSAIDs, alcohol, smoking, and a rare, rare disease called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Okay, again, NSAIDs, alcohol, smoking, Zellinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a rare disorder where you actually have a tumor, like a pancreatic tumor, that pumps out gastrin. You know what gastrin does to hydrochloric acid production? Cranks it up. All right, so these are the mechanisms behind gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, let's dig into the diagnostic approach. All right, my friends, let's actually go through now the diagnostic approach and treatment. Let's make sense of everything that we talked about on the whiteboard. All right, so we have a patient now who we suspect has GERD. One of the biggest things that you have to do first is obtain a 12-lead ECG with your ponens. Now, the reason why is you actually wanna really make sure that the patient doesn't have an acute coronary syndrome. So what I would do is obtain this. If they have ST changes or it's troponin like, is elevated, I would actually work them up for an acute coronary syndrome because retrosternal chest pain can actually be potentially a atypical presentation for ACS. Now, if it's normal, then you can go ahead and work them up for GERD, but make sure that you do this first, okay? Now, if it's normal, you should initiate an empiric PPI trial. The reason why is that we suspect it's GERD and we give them PPIs, it should improve. If it does improve, it's really supportive of GERD, but if they do not improve or they have alarm symptoms, this is what's really terrifying, like what? Well, alarm symptoms would be things like dysphagia because they have strictures now or vomiting. And this could definitely be because of the strictures. There could be anemia due to a lot of esophagitis causing a GI bleed or then potentially having an esophageal cancer that's bleeding. And also weight loss due to just not being able to get food and fluids down through that big old honking uh, esophagus that's now narrowed. These are concerning features. And this, you have to rule out the complications that we talked about with GERD, which is strictures, which we talked about as esophagitis, which we talked about as potentially potentially aspiration. We also said that there's concerns of GI bleed and esophageal cancer. So when this is potentially a concern, you need to get an EGD with a biopsy potentially. Now from this, you may have a lot of abnormal findings such as you may find reflux esophagitis, you may find strictures, you may find Barrett's, you may find esophageal cancer. Those are some of those complications. It may be completely normal, but if you have a normal EGD, they still have features of GERD and they have no improved symptoms with PPI, you just want to be careful that you rule out like a motility disorder of some sort. But also there's another test that if you're going to test for motility problems, you can also check the pH in the esophagus at the same time.
So what we do is we do what's called esophageal manometry, where we put these pressure transducers in the esophagus, and we also check the pH over a 24-hour period in the esophagus. Now, from the manometry study, what's really interesting is it'll tell you what the pressure is in different parts of the esophagus. In GERD, the motility is actually normal in the upper middle and lower esophagus and patients with normal motility the only problem for them is that their lower esophageal sphincter pressure is just a little bit lower than most people and so that's the only thing that's really abnormal but it's helpful because this test will help you to rule out things like achalasia and diffuse esophageal spasm where you'll see that these have high amplitude contractions which are in the mid distal esophagus and diffuse esophageal spasm and then very low peristaltic waves in achalasia in the mid distal esophagus Additionally, it would also show you that they have a very high lower esophageal sphincter pressure and achalasia and a normal lower esophageal sphincter pressure and diffuse esophageal spasm. This is a kind of a cool test to at least rule these disorders out. Now, when you do the pH monitoring, they take this probe, they have these pH centers that are kind of like extended throughout the entire esophagus. Now, if acid that's in the stomach comes up into the esophagus, the pH center will uh, sense a decrease in the pH from seven to like four, and boom, you'll get a point. And however many times that happens, it calculates over to this score called a Demeester score. If that Demeester score is greater than 14.7, it's highly suggestive of GERD, my friends. All right. We've diagnosed GERD, we've diagnosed the complications, we've ruled out a lot of other stuff along the process. How do we treat it? When we treat GERD, you need to increase the tone. That was one of the problems. So there was four problems. The four problems were low esophageal sphincter tone, they had a very high intragastric pressure, they had a hiatal hernia, or they had a lot of hydrochloric acid production. Let's fix those issues. So let's increase the tone in the lower esophageal sphincter. How do we do that? Well, avoid smoking caffeine and alcohol, which are triggers. <laughs> How do we decrease intragastric pressure? Well, we have them avoid very large meals, weight, lose weight, and also consider increasing the motility in patients who have gastroparesis by giving them metoclopramide. How do we reduce the acid production? We give H2RAs, histamine 2 receptor antagonists, if there's no esophagitis and the episodes are mild, less than two per week. Remember, H2RAs were the ones where you're blocking the H2 receptors on the parietal cells, so you decrease Hydrochloric acid production, we're kind of making some connections here. And the next one is you give a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, if they do have esophagitis, because this is a more intense drug, or if their episodes are more than twice a week. So the proton pump inhibitors, you're actually blocking the channel that's pushing the protons out into the actual lumen. So this will also drop the acid production. So you fix these three issues. What if they have a hiatal hernia? Really, you're not doing much for sliding hiatal hernias. You pretty much just kind of, it's supportive care. So do everything that you've been doing above. The only time that you may intervene to consider a surgery is if they have esophagitis, really bad esophagitis, strictures, or a GI bleed. You may need to correct that if you fix everything else at this moment. Now, what if it's just refractory? You have no improvement after doing all of these things. Usually these patients need what's called a Nissen fundoplication. It's a surgery where they take the fundus, and they wrap it around the lower esophageal sphincter to tighten it and increase the tone so that you block reflux up into the esophagus. That's one potential thing that they can try. Now, the last thing that you want to do is after you've treated the patient who has GERD, you really want to survey them, especially for their high risk of cancer. And so because of that, if they have esophagitis and you've treated them with proton pump inhibitors, you should actually consider getting a repeat EGD at some point. If they have Barrett's, so you get the biopsy and it shows metaplasia, but it shows no dysplasia, you should actually get an interval EGD within at least three to five years, just to make sure that it hasn't actually become dysplastic. And if the biopsy shows dysplasia with Barrett's, then you actually need to go ahead and cut that dysplastic tissue out because it's likely gonna become cancerous very, very soon. So cut it out, all right? That covers the treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease, and that covers the video on GERD. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Love you, thank you, and as always, until next time.